Okay, so let's get started on today's class. Today I'm talking about hair, and as you can hear from my smile, I'm really excited about it. If you don't know what form studies are, if you don't know what they're all about, you can't do hair. Form studies are the study of light on form. Form studies is in two parts. It's the form and the light. That's two-parted. Uh, so you can have a drawing of the form uh, without any light applied to it. But you can't have a sketch or a, a rendering of form with zero light applied because then we just end up with a basic block like that that has no dimension to it. It's just, what is that? It's flat. So how do we pop it out? How do we make it look like it's something that is has light on it? Well, we have to give it uh, variation. As you can see, I'm using no lines. Keep that in mind. We have to give it value variation or else we don't know we're looking at something that is that, that is exposed to the light source. We use either shadow or we use light. Actually, this is plenty light. We use light to make something look like it's in the presence of or in under the influence of light. So we apply these kinds of adjustments to it and all of a sudden we have a three-dimensional object. So before we had a flat object and now we have a three-dimensional object. All right, same thing with spheres. We have, oopsie, we have a basic sphere that has absolutely no dimension to it. La la la, same exact value. And then we're going to copy paste that exact sphere beside. I'm just going to uh, yeah, lock that layer, go full black, low opacity. This is called radial shading, radial shading. Look it up on my video history. If you don't know what it is, I go in depth into this. So layer number one of my paint as I go lower, my brush is shrinking and eventually a three dimensional baby is born. Uh, just like that, I go pure white and also responding to the light source as well. Okay, so what is hair? Hair is a very flat thing that can look extremely uh, non-volume, non-form, look extremely flat. It's something that can look extremely two-dimensional. It's hard for a student to grasp it compared to this, which is super easy to grasp. So hair is basically fabric. Think of it like that in the sense that it is in strands, it's in groups, it's in clumps, but I'll get into that. So if you got a piece of fabric and you threw it over, you just draped it over one of these shapes, it would take the shape of the shape, right? So you, you would get a piece of fabric and you throw it over, it would just basically sit on top of this just like that, and it would just drape on top, right? You get the same piece of fabric, throw it over a ball, and it would do the same thing, it would take the shape. So that's what hair is. But hair isn't just a film, it's not just one flat thing. Um, and this is where you guys start messing up. This is where you guys start messing up, okay? Keep it in mind. Hair that you paint doesn't drape and doesn't inherit the shape of the form on which it drapes. Hair that you paint is actually just a flat piece of fabric, it's not multi-layered clumps or groups of fabric, but hair essentially is many pieces of fabric. For instance, this looks like a piece of fabric. This isn't exactly what hair does in this painting, but it's similar to it. And I'll, I'll go into why it looks like hair. But essentially what you're looking at is many individual pieces of fabric moving together. So one hair is many pieces of fabric, so we're basically looking at just a very thin piece of fabric, just like that. But it's also going to be responding to the light source. So if you remember back to my how to do lighting period, like how to lighting video, um, every single surface on either a flat surface or um, a, a curved surface has arrows coming out of it, and these arrows reveal where the light's coming from, meaning that if the light, if this arrow is looking at the light source, it means that area that that arrow came from will have light on it. If it's not looking at the light source, completely turned away or half looking, it'll either get a midtone or a shadow. 
this area, for instance, of this ball is completely looking away from the light. Therefore, that's where the deepest shadow will go. So again, if you don't know what I'm talking about, this was too fast to go over something really complex. Just look up lighting in my video history and you'll be able to find a more thorough video about it. So right now what I'm doing is tracking down where all these arrows are. If they come out perfectly perpendicular from the surface they're on. So <clears throat> this area of the clump is curved that way. So depending on where I put the light source uh, will depend on where, you know, what's, well, everything will depend on where the light source is coming from. So right here, this area doesn't exactly look up at the light. So it'll get like a medium tone all the way down here where we start looking up at the light. So this area and this area will both get highlight. So let's render that. Let's just really quickly render that. And that's it. That's all that goes into hair. I promise you. Um, I know it seems really super crazy, but that's it because everything else is just a checklist. This is where your skill comes in. This is where the skill measurement of you as an artist comes in, is in your ability to render this strand. Oh my God, I can't even last up. Give me a second. All right, everything after this is just technical, meaning hair growth patterns, working from large to small, um, uh, finding, making sure that the hair is, is responding to gravity. These are all checklists. They're not really skill measurements. You can't measure someone's skill because they're aware of gravity. That's not what measures skill. Skill is like your technical ability to manipulate paint. Um, so right here, what I'm gonna do is um, right beside it, or yeah, I'm running out of room. I just showed you where all that light is coming from. I just showed you how my thinking is. If the light's coming from above, that means that we have, again, radial back to radial, we have uh, shadow here that's slowly happening and then highlights up here that's slowly happening um and that's it if you can do this you're golden just make sure that and this is the checklist so get started with your little notes this is the checklist that your curves of your highlights are the same as the curves of the head or the curves of the of the strand itself uh, but if we look at the shape of the hair, that's the shape of the head that the object is, that, that, that it's a sphere, and that the, the, the path of the highlight, it all follows this curvature of the, of the dome of the head. But also each curl will also have a curved highlight on it. See these little highlight strands? They're all curved. They're all in this kind of curved pattern, this C shape. The, the general average is that it dips down and goes back up, dips down and goes back up, even to individual strands, but also as a whole. So if you keep clumping up different clumps of hair, and you can see how I'm avoiding using a small pixel width brush here, we have to paint them as clumped. So this is like tons of hair, hundreds of hairs. Um, and we're painting them as clumps. So each of these little strands right now is, oopsie, each of these little strands at the moment is, uh, is a clump of hair. So we do enough of these in different sizes, we end up getting something that looks a lot like hair. So again, all of my highlights are applied radially. All of my shadows are applied radially. At the end of the day, what we end up doing is working large to small and working our way back to the strands that we rejected at the start of the process. So this is all way too rough. It's, it's starting to look really, really rough and messy. So at this point, you have all kinds of techniques at your disposal. You can get smudge tool on soft brush and start smudging your way around the whole thing. Just these areas here, if you feel like they're too clean, you can always smudge them. You can add a little bit of extra like companion strokes on either side just to give it more of that messy, loose hair. Remember those little clumps I started out with, those three main clumps? They can cast shadows on each other. And the last thing that you want to check off your list is that the hair is responding to gravity, that it's actually shaping towards gravity. It's clumping towards gravity, just like you would have um, a, uh, a piece of cloth that is draping and falling towards gravity. 
um, we have the hair growth pattern, where hair is coming from and where it's going. It's coming from the scalp and it's going away from the scalp, but in which direction? Some point this way, some point this way. The hairs closest to your eyebrows point this way. Um, some hair, depending on the style, will aim to the back of the head towards the crown. Some will drape directly down towards gravity. So the, the very first step of the process is, again, remember it's a form study. So find your core shadows. Find the core shadows. Find the light source. Uh, the very first step is to just build the, the shape. So let's say you have a head. You found the light source and you found the core shadows of that head. The next thing you're going to do is just decide on the style. Uh, how is this hair looking? Once you decide on the style, you're going to decide on where the hair growth pattern is coming from. So first is form. Second is style. You can outline the style. You can draw it. Three is the hair direction. So where the hair is directed, where it's moving, the hair growth pattern. Some will move to the back. Some will move towards the crown. Then the character is going to wear some kind of crown and some are going to drape down. Um, and then four, you're going to find the clumps, you're going to find the groups. The very first group could be the initial most silhouette of the hair, like it, it's in different sections. So this group at the top could look like something like this. And then the second group, it goes this direction and we kind of give it its own little volume as well. So basically the initial groups, meaning your, your first form, and then this, the subgroups, which is going to be uh, the, the strands. Oh, I don't want to say strands, but that still sounds thin. The ribbons, I guess. Ribbons is a good, a good word for it. The main group ribbons or ribbon groups. And then you divide those. You just keep dividing. You just get smaller and smaller and smaller. The brush size you use for this size is basically um, a medium large. It's not really the brush you use to block, but slightly smaller than the brush you use to block the whole face. And then you get into a thinner brush, which is to create those subgroups. And then the, the final little clumps, again, I used smudge brush for that, but you can use all kinds of stuff for that. These little groups are going to be measured with, again, the, the fingers in the back of your hand. You do not want to paint the entire process with these little guys. You get infinity number uh, for the blocks as long as you feel like you've built a really nice fine volume to start the hair with. You could do it form study style, lasso that thing all the way until you're ready to divide it into clumps. These, I would say, if it's like an average, I would say 20 brush strokes, tops, tops, for, for the entire hair to divide them. I mean, look, we, we did so much with three clumps. So 20 brush strokes is a lot. Uh, meaning it's 20 clumps um, and this doesn't have to be a brush stroke it could be lassoed in and then finally these are like if you pick each clump it's like one one strand up to two thin strands of clump and this is not even done yet so if I was going to continue this this study into a full hair study I would get rid of most of these I would just find you know one or two main strands as the flyaway strands, just like you see here. One, two, three, and those are the flyaways. You get a lot with flyaways. So you have one, two, three, four, and then a strand, and then five, which, which collect the entire back head area. Other things I would do here, I would just be a little bit more picky. I would erase towards the ends because the thinner the hair, the more transparent it is because there's more light and, and spaces of light in between the hair. And, um, and then I would just pick which of these are kind of canceling out the shadow uh, to, to express more dimension. And you want to shade the medium clumps to the light, but not uniformly. Hair is also oily, so it groups together into groups, but, but has like bands of highlight moving through it. So when you do those um, clumps here, you have to remember, prepare for that bounce light that will be expected of you here and here. Hair takes the shape of the parent object, so when you're grouping into clumps or when you're deciding on the hair direction, between these two steps, you're remembering the hair is falling on top of a dimensional object, three-dimensional object. It's going to take the shape of that object. One thing for hair is to think random. It's hard to think random because even saying that is antithetical. Like, Think random. Just by thinking, you're no longer being random. Don't try to be too clean. Not every brush stroke is going to be perfectly sized. 
don't get lost in all of this uh, rendering because at the end of the day, you still can't render more than we see in focal point with the face. Look at a reference, it's an abundance of information. You see every individual hair and that becomes problematic. So if you find yourself incapable of, of not seeing the individual hairs, copy paste or adjust your reference as much as you need to so that you are no longer seeing those strands. So adjust your reference to limit the information that's flowing in. In fact, it's more beneficial to you to have a reference of hair that's blurred. Um, you can see shadow blocks easier. You can see the individual clumps and strands much easier. Um, and you can see even the saturation band much easier. And I recommend blurring for all kinds of stuff, not just blurring, uh, pixelate, mosaic, um, that'll also help you limit the flow of information so you can see clumps a lot better. You can just look at that. It's so easy to reference off of this. You'll still have access to the full picture, uh, but only as you continue your painting. The start of your painting process should be really, really altered information uh, so that you're not overwhelmed. Uh, so even if you have to grayscale it so you can find the value ranges. Uh, so learn efficiently. And then finally, when adding color, you want to make sure, as I usually say, you're adding color in highlights. Some people do it, some don't, some artists do it, but on average, no matter what texture you're using, even the highlight on a portrait, the highlight is more pale and the midtone is more saturated. Look at the reference, the realistic reference, close to no saturating, but then you go on the outside and we're looking at saturation. It's directly on the outside of that highlight belt that we get saturation. No saturation on the highlight, extreme outside border, I mean directly outside border uh, of highlight we get saturation. So let's take all that over here and just do a quick paint over. Um, so hair growth pattern is this way, so I'm just going to move the canvas so it rotates to, to, for my, for my kind of hand comfort and I'm just going to break these up randomly into different sections. It shouldn't matter that much how many sections I'm breaking it up into. All that matters is that I'm just creating this randomization with a large brush to, to result in some random pattern that I may be able to work with. So it's not, there's no vision in mind. We're just putting random brush strokes together in the hopes that the results, by th in theory, are going to be uh, more pleasing to the eye than what you had before. So here this looks good. I'm going to do this second line of brush sizes, which is slightly smaller brush size. And I'm going to look for those little pockets and breaking those clumps into even smaller clumps. And you see this mess here? That's okay. Who cares? You can always recede it back into the shadow um, if you feel like, okay, this is too raw on edge. And then I'm going to uh, break those into even smaller clumps. And so I'm just going to try to find where the little breathing room areas are. And these, these are the ones that make me think. These are the brush strokes that, that keep me up at night. These are the ones that you have to strate strategize. These are the ones that you have to think about. These are the game changers that make the hair feel complete. But again, don't rush into these if you feel like you're not ready. Um, Find those major clumps, find where the light source is coming from. So I know that this whole area is rejecting light up until around this point. And then I get a lot of uh, uh, receiving of the light. So I'm going to try to find where that light is and just create this little path of light just there. Same here, this area is sort of rejecting the light up until right here along this band where we start getting a lot more light. So I'm placing in like this averaging of highlights around that area. So we're just breaking things up and reconnecting them together to make it seem like oil is clumping all of these individual parts together, but they are individual in, in those areas. You don't want to completely black out an area either. You want the shadow to be general. Um, here, look at this. Like you used way too many individual brush strokes. 
or you could have just rendered it as a ribbon as a strand and stop there. Right, just around there as well. Um, over here, it's mostly bounce light coming from the ambient light around, so you could just start from scratch. Um, you don't have to use any of these values. You can use a whole set of new values, but the brush strokes are still the same. Large to small, thinking about cast shadows, thinking about which brush strokes are on top of other brush strokes. There's a lot more light in this area, so I feel like this whole area is receiving some light. Um, so I'm going to try to find those little high contrast points where the hair may be uh, tucked in or following what some what at one point it was behind her ear, but it kind of draped back down and kind of uh, loosened from behind her ear. All right, and then I'm adding a bit of a shadow there. There's a small little pocket clumped in there where every hair starts to get tucked into. Um, the neck area or the side of the face it's receded into shadow. It's starting to reject a lot of light, so there's no reason to keep it uh, visible or have light there, and it's not that reflective. And I'm just adding um, a little bit of extra visibility on those flyaways. You can use a better brush. I'm just torturing myself at this point with this brush because it's too clunky for hair, uh, for later hair. Like it's great for starting hair, but it's a little bit too clunky and square uh, for something like hair, which is a, needs a bit more of a cir circular brush or organic brush for the late game stuff. You want the square brush for the start, though. Uh, you definitely do because all of these brush strokes here are very square-like, so you do want a blocking brush. Um, and I'm just always checking my navigator because it is a distance game. Um, you want to do more with less. That means zooming out, putting that brush stroke exactly where it needs to go. And uh, maybe we could afford a bit more contrast. Certain areas may have just clumped in such a way where they have a bit darker strands. Oops, a bit darker strands here or there. Um, that uh, reject some of the light. Now this is blonde. It's easy to draw because you can see all the clumps. But when it comes to darker hair, you don't see that many clumps. You just see where the highlight is. Um, then I'm going to get my dodge tool on highlight and I'm going to try to create that path of highlight that runs across the face, um, across the hair. Uh, so I'm just finding, it's not always going to be one perfect belt like that. It's going to be every other strand up or down, depending on where you put it. And Dodge Tool is very dangerous. Uh, I've said that a million times, I think, so far. Um, so uh, when I'm using it, I'm using it with the knowledge of how it's failing me as an artist. So I know it's giving me way too much saturation in those highlights. Dodge tool for hair is like the opposite of what you want it to do for hair, which is why we have to go back and stop dodge tool from doing that, which is getting a color, finding that mid-tone, and just getting rid of all the saturation it gave us, because we did not need it. No, thank you. We don't need that saturation. We just want that little spike of highlight. On the direct outsides, however, we do want saturation, so we're just saturating um, directly outside of each highlight belt, just on the outskirts. We can saturate a little bit wherever we might have some subsurface scattering, just wherever we have a pocket of shadow that may have been illuminated a little bit. Um, and then we're just going to start the rendering process, which is like that thing I showed you with the smudge tool. So you can get smudge brush on soft brush or smudge tool on soft brush and just go over each uh, each little area with that smudge tool until it feels right to you. So, oopsie. So, we're kind of trying to reduce how much we're seeing. It's like getting blur or motion blur and applying it on everything in the general direction that hair grows. This is both to incorporate all those loose, rough brush strokes together, but also to encourage the, the eyes to keep looking towards the eye of the, of the painting um, and not kind of just like overwhelm the focal point too much. So you can use smudge brush, you can use like a pencil brush or a basic sketching brush 
to kind of just throw in those strands. You can use a smudge brush that has three heads to it so you get that kind of triple uh, uh, brush stroke effect there. But what we're doing is we're just going through this area here and there and just cleaning up, connecting, disconnecting. Um, it's really hard to describe exactly what you need to do and when. You just feel your way through it without damaging all the work you've done so far. So like all these extra brush strokes you had here, I'm getting rid of those. Remember, I'm critiquing and painting at the same time. You'll be mostly uh, just starting from scratch in your piece. So over here, I'm adding a little strand and over here as well. And that's all I'm doing. I'm just finding the, 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 the what randomization resulted in. So remember, you're gambling and you're going to, you know, if you're not gambling right, you're going to get a combination of really bad brush strokes. But you keep keep kind of like throwing the dice, seeing what you what you results, uh, what the result is, seeing what you end up with and go with it. So all of this wasn't planned. This wasn't in my head. This is just a result of the theory. And I'm just being very careful. See that it control Z that brush stroke three times before I finally settled on one of them. Being super, super careful with where I place those little brush strokes, reducing opacity. Each section needs one, uh, but I don't want to place a million and my accuracy isn't going to be perfect every time. So I'm control Z until I get it to look right. And um, then I'll show you that final polish stage is when I get soft brush and kind of just clean up that uh, uh, upper half, lower half, and just kind of try to defuse everything. So pencil brush or a smudge tool or a combination of the two, your choice. And remember, this is a drawing of hair. It shouldn't look like a photo of hair, unless you're trying to do photorealism. And if so, why, why are you trying to do photorealism? Um, it should look like a very generalized, theoretical sort of version of what hair is and what hair does. It shouldn't look like actual hair. We shouldn't be seeing many, many individual strands. Uh, so this area is kind of confusing me. I don't like it very much. So I'm going to go into liquify and make sure that this area isn't just like randomly straight. See how it's randomly just dead straight. I want to give it some of that natural gravity um, that curvature and just make it look a little bit cooler. And hair likes to just uh, kind of clump. Um, when it's shorter, it curls more. Uh, so I just want to see more curves in the hair, less straight. On average, you should be seeing way more curves than straight lines. You know, like it's safe to say, please don't show us straight lines with hair. Like never have straight lines with hair. And um, some of these areas, I mean, it's really cool when you make hair layer on top of it. So just make sure you clean it up. It's hard to render around a hair strand that's layering on top of the other hair. You have to kind of keep it in a separate layer to be able to do that. But you can pull off a lot without layering too much. Again, it's just the illusion of hair. And this is the main takeaway from our texture unit. You are painting the illusion of the texture, not the actual texture itself. Write that back to me. Um, and again, I can't go through every single type of hair. Um, and I can't go through every like type and color and tone and, and, and amount and some hair that's pure white is thinner than hair that's uh, more dense. Uh, so it's, it's just this, but it doesn't matter because you will get a reference for what you need. But in order to read the reference, you have to remember all this. Um, so remember reading the reference, it needs a blueprint. That's the fundamental knowledge, altering your reference so it doesn't overwhelm you. And, um, and then just working with uh, the, the idea that you're not actually painting hair. This isn't hair, it doesn't, it works like hair, it looks like hair, but it is not hair. Um, and that's how you keep your drawings um, from get overwhelming the, the, the focal point. That's how you keep the hair from overwhelming the focal point. Um, and I'm just, uh, for where, wherever you see hair end, that's where you can kind of go a little bit more. You can just crank up that, brush stroke meter up a little bit. You start really picking up the mileage on the brush strokes towards the ends. But the, 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 the condition for using this many brush strokes is just going back with smudge tool or something or eraser and making sure those brush strokes that you're using towards the ends, those thin ones, those flyaway ones 
are transparent. Um, they are translucent a little bit. They have a bit lower opacity and they just look generally uh, more clumped, more like V shape than individual little hairs flying around. And now for the extra step of realism, I'm really shrinking my brush and I'm letting the hair on the outside get a, a, a large amount of flyaways. And again, this ends up getting edited and blurred because I don't want raw brush strokes hanging out on the outsides, um, just unaltered like that. But they do add that little bit of realism. And I'm just control Z until I find a better combination that I like. It's usually the bright ones, even, even the darker hairs that fly away end up catching more light. So it's not just in blonde hair that the flyaway hairs are catching more light than the regular amount. And I'm going to throw like one or two right there in the middle, just in the middle, just those little extra additional hairs that make everything look realistic. I want to adjust that. But before I do, I'm just going to run that through a Gaussian blur. It's not a lot of blurring. It's just enough that it doesn't read as a focal line anymore. Um, and then I'm just going to adjust this little section here. So this area looks like it's dividing up into two pieces and is just overlapping. So I'm just showing off where that happens. Just there. And then I'm going to get my dodge tool and I'm just going to try to push those highlights a bit further. And this is where you can have a bit of fun with the highlights, whatever you feel like doing for contrast for that particular day. It doesn't have to be a lot of contrast. And then with a larger dodge tool, I'm just kind of letting that peak the entire area up. And with soft brush on large, I'm going to let that highlight kind of bloom outward. It's just going to pick up the whole area. Um, and that's a, another reason why uh, that polishing stage is so important. You're considering one more time where the light is coming from. And this is if you really want to make it highlight in that way. So I don't have time to bring everything else to the same rendering level as this, but you guys saw this it's just like flip it and that's exactly what you're doing on the other side. Um, except that you just have to remember to keep track of where your light source is coming from. So this section, I'm just going to divide it into a couple more sections here. So this piece kind of goes there. And raise your opacity. Don't do too many brush strokes for one clump. It'll then start to look like it has like this haze or blur over it, uh, which doesn't look good. Do some confident brush strokes. Uh, apply them confidently and uh, it'll start to look better. So that little strand there, I like how that looks. And that little strand may have lost some light towards this side, but picked it right back up towards that lower side. And again, it's just the same physics, the same ribbon physics I showed you guys early on. Um, same thing here, this clump is on top of this clump and, uh, and just keep going with it. It's a lot to do. Uh, but as long as you remember not to interrupt the clumps you already established, then you're good. So today's theory started at the start, the Big Bang. Today's hair theory, it can apply to anything. So we started with form structures. Um, that means that this form structure can carry into hair, clothing, portraits, uh, uh, anatomy and figure drawing, other textures, other objects. If you can render these objects, in light, you can render anything. So that's what I did today. That's what I started with. These clumps, these polygonal shapes, these clumps, whatever, all eventually become these other objects. But they have to be this first. To be a good artist, you have to know how to render all of this. It's not hard. You just grayscale it and just start studying some form studies. Once you get through this form study, then you can start adding conditions to the form studies. This condition is that it's this color and this translucency. This condition is that it's many small ribbons instead of one big clump of a, of a, of a blob. It's actually a really long blob. That's all hair is, just a long blob um, with kind of like a fringed end. Um, so remember, if you, this is all moot, this is all, this all does not apply to you if you don't know how to render basic forms and it, you don't have to spend too long on it. My private tutoring students, 
no matter how good they think they are, or how good they are, or how uh, many illustrations they've successfully completed, I don't care. I pass them through at least one month of form study. So even the advanced students, even my beginner for uh, private tutoring students, some students book with me, they've never drawn before at all, not one sketch. They're just like, I want to get good and I want to learn it here. I still run all the students, beginner or advanced, through this form study level because if, they, if I don't know what they can do with this, how could I assign them advanced textures and advanced illustrations? And if you want to join um, the community, how do you join it? You just go to istabrak.com and you click on the subreddit icon here. This will take you to my subreddit. I pick pieces to critique from here, but I also pick pieces to critique from my Discord. So go to the community tab and click on here to join the official Discord server. Um, and uh, I have posted it and pinned it at the top of the community here. Uh, so today we did hair. I just posted the metallic surfaces. It'll be uh, available to you guys soon. Uh, next up is gonna be clouds. So do some hair, clouds, metallic surfaces. I'll, I'll critique all of them. And that's it. If you guys learned something today and you want to give back, please, please, please consider joining as a $1 patron. That's just $1 a month to get the full recording from today's tutorial. So this was an hour long class uh, for anyone who was joining the live stream. They got it for free. But if you guys want to get it, you just have to join for $1 on Patreon. I submit all of the full live streams. Uh, the full recording for patrons so please consider joining as one dollar it's that's also supportive for the community um and it keeps everything running uh thank you guys for watching i'll see you guys uh next week for uh hair and clouds added on bye guys